there was a point when we screened the film in its earliest form uh, all up on story reels. And nobody really cared for it. And the whole picture collapsed. It was, everyone was afraid that, geez, we may not even do this. They may cancel the movie. What occurred was what we refer to as Black Friday. The mood was, you know, funereal. <laughs> I mean, the mood was terrible because a lot of the work had already been done. You know, a huge amount of storyboarding and planning had taken place, you know, by that point. I came back to our offices and I was walking around the hallways looking at all the storyboards and the idea of starting over again was daunting. <laughs> I was not looking forward to it. So they had to scramble very quickly and try to rethink and rework almost the whole movie and the schedule never changed. I do remember during that period just waking up in the middle of the night in like a cold sweat and, and just um, with kind of your life passing before your eyes. And, and still we had the pressure. It wasn't like we could just sort of sit back and feel bad. We, we were suddenly in an intense situation where we had to really, really move quickly. We took eight days to restructure the story. Then we brought um, our group together, our storyboard writers, uh, in a room, and we got out bulletin boards and really worked through the entire story from beginning to end. When we got to the end of that eight days, we pitched to Jeffrey Katzenberg that outline to him, and he said, fine, he'll go with that. Yeah. And from there on, uh, we brought in Ted and Terry, um, the writers. Part of the animation process is that uh, they explore the story and, and put together it on story reels and uh, preview the movie. And I think they just felt like we just need some new ideas from somewhere. Ted and Terry had an interest in animation, a background at least as far as growing up and watching cartoons. <laughs> there was no doubt once we had interviewed them that everybody wanted to go with those two guys. Nah. Try to stay out of trouble while I'm gone. Well, our first thing is, yeah, get rid of the mom. And I go, yeah, we've been talking about that. Mothers, children. We sort of became de facto executioners. Now, that goes, boom. Rule number one, I can't kill anybody. They had also discussed three wishes versus unlimited wishes. You know, you rub, I show, you ask, I do. And we just decisively said three wishes. We said, no way, can't do it any other way. And we're very forceful on that point. That's it. Three. One of those strikes. With Ted and Terry's help and with all the storyboard artists' help and Ed and everybody else that, that we got it back up. It was a pretty nerve-wracking time, but somehow it all worked out. And suddenly things started to pull together, and once they pulled together, they pulled together amazingly quickly. Getting through Black Friday was an accomplishment, but that didn't mean our work was over. Uh, several months later, uh, we had to tackle redesigning our main character. But you know, it's all in a day's and a year's work. <laughs>
He's too hard to draw. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a meeting where we had to explain what the new design was and how much work we had to get done. Unfortunately, that's who we have to draw. <laughs> I think Ron and John like the direction of going with a smaller approach to Aladdin. And so then when Jeffrey came in and said, no, no, we, we want to make him more of a hero type, you know, so he looks like he can get that girl. Ron and John didn't want to give up on this very youthful, expressive, kind of boyish sort of a quality to him. Well, I think just that, that the story was so based on Aladdin being kind of an underdog and being, I mean, he's a kid, uh, he's a street rat, he's grown up in poverty, and that's part of the problem of the story is that he, he has to learn to be himself and kind of appreciate being himself. So, so I think that was just the, the, the fear of, of going too far. Well, I remember had those 40 thieves. I knew that Aladdin was going through this sort of evolution because you would see the pictures would change. I mean, there were musical numbers that had been animated way before I came along. And if you if you look closely, he looks much younger. But then yeah, I would come back and I'd see another picture of Aladdin, and he look very old. He looked much older than I was. All you gotta do is rub that lamp. Now, if that's all I did was explain uh, technically what we had to do, I can guarantee we never would have done that picture, because artists don't respond to um, numbers or charts or even money. You've got to you got to tell them why. You've got to help them understand and get them to start to to believe in why you are doing what you're doing. So most of my lectures to our crew would be a kind of a combination, maybe 10% information, 90% inspiration, trying to get them encouraged to actually go and do this. On the outside, he's, he's a really confident guy, but somewhere deep inside, he's insecure. After that, the gun went off, and we just went running full speed to the finish line. And amazingly, somehow it got done. You know, I, couldn't, you, you, I think of it back now, and it's a good thing I was in my, well, I guess my early 30s, because like right now, I don't know if I'd had that kind of energy to work those kind of hours that we did. I guess I didn't know what I was really up against at that point, uh, even though I looked calm and controlled. At that, uh, in the meeting, I probably, in my head, was running around screaming. <laughs> I choose you, Aladdin. <laughs> Call me Al. Jafar? Oh, <laughs> princess. <laughs> Jafar. How may I be of service to you? The guards just took a boy from the market, on your orders. Oh, your father has charged me with keeping peace in Agrabah. The boy was a criminal. What was his crime? By kidnapping the princess, of course. Jafar? Jafar? Oh, uh, princess. Ah, Jafar, I'm stuck. How may I be of service to you? The guards just took a boy from the market, on your orders. Oh, your father has charged me with keeping peace in Agrabah. The boy was a criminal. What was his crime? I can't breathe, Jafar. Why, kidnapping the princess, of course. Jafar, you can just... Ah, oh, that hurt! Jafar? Oh, <laughs> princess. <laughs> ah, Jafar, I'm stuck. How may I be of service to you? The guards just took a boy from the market, on your orders. Oh, your father has charged me with keeping peace in Agrabah. The boy was a criminal. What was his crime? I can't breathe, Jafar. By kidnapping the princess, of course. Jafar, you can just... Ah, oh, that hurt! Jafar? Oh, <laughs> princess. <laughs> ah! Jafar, I'm stuck. How may I be of service to you? The guards just took a boy from the market, on your orders. Oh, your father has charged me with keeping peace in Agrabah. The boy was a criminal. What was his crime? I can't breathe, Jafar. Why, kidnapping the princess, of course. Pop, you can just... Ah, that hurt! You, uh, know this girl? Sadly, yes. 
in animation, you've got 24 drawings for every second. And this is only several seconds on the screen, but it's taken me a month to work on. Here Aladdin is talking to the street vendor and every movement is, is really me doing the acting. When we flip through the animation, we can actually get an impression of what it's gonna look like on the screen. We uh, try to see if there's anything that in the movement that seems a little clunky or, or out of whack, and so we can really check it to see what it's gonna be like in the final film. Oh, thank you, kind sir. I'm so glad you found her. I've been looking all over for you. What are you doing? In this scene, Aladdin rescues Jasmine from the street vendor. She says, what are you doing? He says, just play along. The guy grabs him and says, you uh, know this girl? Sadly, yes. She's my sister. She's a little crazy. She said she knew the Sultan. <laughs> she thinks the monkey is the Sultan. Al Poro. Last one. I'll draw Leonard. <laughs> Big trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nick, we're going to have a very good time revisiting Aladdin. And I want to welcome you especially on behalf of think? Walt Disney Studios and Walt Disney. I'm wasting my time as a composer. <laughs> what are you going to do next? This is a very exciting show. Everyone's drawing pictures here. That shows how exciting it is listening to this. Because of the Robin Williams thing, of course. Good thing it worked. And there he is. There's the likeness. Yes. Wow, this is cool. Aladdin looks much younger there. Looks like a little kid. Yeah, Aladdin was younger when we started out. Uh... This Aladdin looked much younger in the movie, too. <laughs> he looks a lot hunkier here than he does here. He looks a little bit like a, like a little kid. He looks like he's 12 years old in that in that shot. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, 12 years old with the princess might have been tough, but originally <laughs> he, was, he was maybe about, like, maybe 15, and uh -huh. I think he ended up being more like 18. But you 18. were like... I think, when we started, you were 16? I think, yeah, we started, I was 15 or 16, and then the movie was released. I was, I was 17 when the movie was released. So, unbelievable. Now we're going to be joined by another key member of the Aladdin team, a man who's composed music for Aladdin, Pocahontas, Beauty and the Beast, and The Little Mermaid, an eight-time Academy Award winner. Please welcome Alan Menken. Oh, please, oh, please. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Alan, you and your late partner, Howard Ashman, were in some ways the instigator of this project. You, you had a, a concept for Aladdin early on? Yeah, well, you know, Howard did. First of all, in the original treatment, the genie was, was kind of a hipster. He had an earring and he had this hipster look to him, at least in the original drawings. Yeah. And so Howard thought, you know, why don't we give him like a Fats Waller or Cab Calloway kind of element? Mr. Alonzo, what will your pleasure be? So that, it took us to that place. I think a, a lot of the fun of the score is that mix of, of Middle Eastern and, and American jazz, mm -hmm. um, and, and especially the black in idiom and the, and the swing idiom. It's just this intangible mix. Mm -hmm. That, that worked, and that was there in our original score, mm -hmm. and much of it remains. Friend Like Me is, was one of the first songs we wrote, and, and one of my favorites. You never had a friend like me. <laughs> and friend Like Me is, is very special to me, number one, because it's one of Howard Ashman's greatest lyrics. You got some power in your corner now. It's heavy ammunition in your camp. You got some punch to dance. Yahoo and house, all you gotta do is rub that lamp. I love performing that number in public, just me personally, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm on the job, you take 